Welcome to Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Duke Oishi. In our show tonight, we'll cover the third Clean Energy Day program presented by the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum at the Laniakea Women's Y on July 8th. A crowd of 250 showed up to hear the governor and top energy people in industry, labor, and government, and it was a rousing statement for our energy initiative. Governor Neil Abercrombie came to express his views about the importance of the initiative. He also surprised the crowd by actually signing a bill, the on-bill financing bill, right there at the podium. What excitement. House Bill 1520, many of you may be uh, familiar. It directs the Public Utilities Commission, I see Mina is, 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 here, is here today uh, from the PUC, to investigate how on-bill financing could operate in Hawaii and gives the PUC the discretion to implement such a program. I believe that, yes, there are, are arguments to be made pro and con about how uh, on-bill financing works or could work or should work. And uh, one of the reasons I wanted to uh, uh, put this bill on the, on the question about whether to veto or not is to give an opportunity to continue some discussions with folks about how this might operate, be able to talk to folks in the PUC about it. On-bill financing for the, for the three people in the room who don't know what we're talking about. Uh, allows an electric utility company customer to purchase renewable energy systems or a device about renewable energy and, and put it on their electric bill and pay for it over time through energy savings. Now it's easy to say it's another thing to actually implement it and make it work, but the idea is if you never get started, if you don't take the first step, then it's not going to happen at all. 100% of nothing is nothing. It could be construed as an unfunded mandate. Uh, and I understand, I don't want to do that, that kind of thing if I can avoid it. We're $1.3 billion in the hole as we go into the, these, these next two years. But, you know, when you're in an emergency, when you're in a crisis, you, that's when you pull it up and you do it. You don't sit there and, and, and say, here's all the things that are in the way of getting it done. So what? Something's always in the way of getting it done. But the whole point here is, is that we wanted to make this energy change. We want to get to green energy. We want to get to energy independence. The Blue Planet Foundation has offered to work with the PUC to help cover the costs and lessen the burden uh, to fulfill the requirements of, of, of 1520. Uh, a docket on on-bill financing can be opened right away. We can determine whether and, whether and how on-bill financing program can be designed so that we can get the maximum amount of people to participate and we can move to a, a green energy and a clean energy future. I'm convinced that if we work together we can advance the clean energy goals and, 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 and put the kind of determination and urgency to the question, not just of, uh, of on-bill financing, but of green energy and clean energy in the state. And so what I'd like to do with your permission here today is take this step in front of you right now and sign 1520 relating to renewable energy and make it law. We heard from three Blue Ribbon panels, one on building an energy workforce, one on attracting capital for energy development, and a third on how government has done and what it should do to advance the initiative. The first panel was the Labor and Workforce panel, moderated by State Director of Labor Dwight Takamini, featuring panelists Darren Kimura, David Loveless, Jeff Matsu, and Scott Murakami. So from the Hawaii Green Jobs Initiative's perspective, collaboration and community involvement is critical. Um, we don't exist in a bubble just producing data. Uh, we produce the data to um, stimulate informed decision making and conversation. And it's events exactly like this that are critical in terms of digesting that information, giving us feedback in terms of what makes sense, what doesn't. This is just the first step. I'll be the first to admit that it's not you know, the holy grail. Um, we need your feedback. And all of this, all of these comments and questions is really good stuff. So keep it coming. Visit us online at greenjobshawaii.org. Give me a call. Um, we're working with all of these guys. And that's really what it's all about, teamwork. I think, um, generally speaking, I'm frustrated too. And, and that's the sense I get from you guys. I think that what I'm hearing is that we have all these great ideas and no answers and no place to go. And, and that's how I feel. And we got to somehow come up with a path forward here. Because if we don't build that now, we're going to continue to buy it. And we're going to lose the companies that are here. Um, Sunetrix, the Sopages, and whatnot. Eventually, there's not going to be a market here because there's not going to be workforce here. And those companies will be gone. And I don't want that future for Hawaii. So I think we're on a, on a clock. I think we have to move very quickly. 
Um, I think we do need leadership from policy, but also from industry. Um, so, you know, as we network this afternoon, let's talk about this further and let's see, you know, between us, uh, if we can come up with a plan or if nothing else, maybe a next step, someplace else to meet next, talk about the ideas, get them out there. As Governor Abercrombie said that uh, our kids are not cynical of today, but yet they're ingenious as well. We have to find new methods of teaching those children and in methods of what we are trying to implement. We are, this audience is uh, on average of a higher age than what we would be bringing forth in the green technologies of our kids. So in a example of me teaching a pipe bending class, I have younger students there and I show them an application on the phone to calculate how to bend conduit and they love it. So different types of technologies for these kids are gonna be, have to be taught in different methods. So those types of thinking as well is gonna be a problem solving for us as well. What we're really talking about is economic growth, our economy, right, our state economy. And that requires the factors of production to come together and work together, all to push that, that uh, frontier forward, the economic frontier forward. Um, and that's something that it's important to remember because we are, uh, I think this is the most important part, I think we're all in it together. And I think people need to remember that, that we need to all work together, we all need to look toward the future, how we want our economy to grow and where we want it to be and realize that we're the ones who have to do it ourselves. The, the panelists here are willing to, we're gonna have a, we're gonna schedule a meeting, you know, um, after this, this, uh, this day, and to try to see how we can work together better. Now this is just one of three panels, okay, but in the area of jobs, workforce development, we're gonna try to see how, by working together and, you know, sort of the, what, what Darren described, how we can do what we're already doing better so that the entire, so that the agenda can move forward. The second panel was a capital investment panel moderated by the Director of Business, Economic Development and Tourism, Richard Lim, featuring panelists Carl Fuchs, Jay Kwok, Don Lippert and Michael Pfeffer. Uh, our topic today is how do we attract capital and financing for clean energy. Uh, if we want to increase, you know, jobs like we just talked about, innovation and development in Hawaii, access to capital and financing is critical. DBIT is already tracking 64 large-scale active projects as we speak, uh, and we've talked to literally hundreds and hundreds of companies. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of business out there, but money is still an issue. For my segment, I'd, I'd focus on where is the capital? Uh, you know, if you want to figure out how to attract it, maybe you need to first see where it is and where it's going. So I have some statistics I'd just like to share with you. These are global trends in where financing is going for clean, clean energy projects, but I think they mirror and track what we see here in Hawaii. So first off, it's been a significant increase in financing for clean energy over the years. So five years ago, levels of financing were around five to $10 billion a quarter. Again, this is globally. Currently, we're running at 35 to $40 billion a quarter. So very dramatic increase. But where is that money coming from? By and large, it's project finance. When I was first asked to talk, someone asked me, well, how much is it going to cost to transform Hawaii to clean energy? And some of you may have been familiar with the study that we did a couple of years ago that said it would cost 18 to $20 billion to transform Hawaii to 70% clean energy. So we're not all the way there, but it's a, it's a big chunk. And that's 18 to $20 billion of capital investment, and that's a big number. But I think there's a number that's more interesting to me right now and I think based on what Darren said and what Richard was saying a lot of people here which is the probably can be measured in the tens of millions of dollars and that's the amount of money that it would really take to invest in and amplify Hawaii's innovation industry. I think people here are aware of Sofiji and aware of Synetric and some of these other companies but there are actually dozens of innovation companies in Hawaii that are right now selling technologies, creating technologies and deploying technologies in Hawaii and exporting them. So we're looking uh, primarily at customers that are uh, looking for a project size under 500 kW. And so that was very difficult to find in Hawaii. Uh, I was with a, a large commercial bank here. And what we found that was the, uh, the real desire to pursue these projects was not there. So we went outside of the state and looked for a different kind of capitals. And frankly, what we found was there's a lot of opportunity outside of the state. Clearly, California, New York, all these uh, commercial banks and uh, equity institutions 
uh, all find that they have familiarity with uh, the technologies that we employ in Hawaii. And so there, there are much desire to deploy these type of capitals in Hawaii. You know, first of all, if you're talking about finance uh, in, this, in the energy sector, you have to separate out and policies and how you're going to support uh, financing green energy and clean tech. You have to separate out the policies that are really aimed at residential, um, small business, uh, and, that, and that sort of level of financing, you know, a few hundreds of thousands to a few millions of dollars uh, from the large commercial scale type projects, which is really what I want to focus on today. Uh, Don estimated 18 to 20 billion. I think that's probably low. The third panel was the Government Action Panel, moderated by Jeff Michelina, Executive Director of the Blue Planet Foundation, featuring panelists Mike Gabbard, Danny Kaufman, Mina Morita, Estrella Cease, all important government officials. Uh, I just want to, the takeaway from what I said is that the, governor, uh, the government's role in all of this is to enable and facilitate our energy transformation. Our vision for energy future requires partnerships between the government, the private sector, as well as the community. The nation and the world is taking notice of our energy uh, movement in Hawaii. I know that because I get a lot of calls. Um, and we need to sustain and to ratchet up our activities in this area. And we need you as much as you need us. I, I guess for me, you know, I have three granddaughters. And um, you know, what kind of future do I want to leave for them? And, and for me, that's, that's the motivation, that's the drive. You know, what will our future look like? And what will we leave for future generations? To wrap it up, I'd like to encourage everyone here to let me know if you have any ideas as far as legislation, uh, energy legis policy that's uh, needed to help us move forward. Um, you know, you guys are the energy experts, right? So we need the input to hear from you folks on what's going to work. And we'll try our best. And finally, as I mentioned earlier about, we need to feel a sense of urgency more about what we're doing. And I'll close with a saying from Confucius. And I quote, someone who really wants to do something finds a way, someone who doesn't finds an excuse, unquote. So no more excuses, colleagues. And by that, I mean you folks as well. It's not just us up here. We need to get moving. Aloha. I'll just uh, share a thought that keeps running through my mind in terms of legislation. And, and I welcome any feedback from anybody out there um, to, to move forward with going towards geothermal. And let's talk, I'm from the Big Island. Um, and, and Helco, of course, is our utility there. Um, do we need a law that mandates that they shut down all those fully depreciated fossil fuel plants? Is that, is that something we need to do to move forward? Um, is that what it's going to take? Um, so I'm, I'm open for feedback. <laughs> that could be another hour discussion right there. <laughs> um, so just in looking at my notes, I have um, Everyone committed to supporting a $25 per barrel tax next session um, and free rides to Kapolei with Senator Gabbard. Uh, no, but I really appreciate the discussion and expertise that you all shared. Uh, so let's uh, thank, our, thank our panel this afternoon. Then we brought the three moderators together for a closing super panel on what to make of all this and what to take away from the program. Having served in the legislature, you know, what became very clear is that when you have consensus, when you have industry people, community people, business people, labor people, all lobbying together on the same thing, the likelihood that it'll move is much greater than when you have conflict. And you know, at times in the public hearing, right, uh, it's all playing one side off against the other. So I think that's true. I think gatherings like this become critical if, if besides hearing all the good ideas, the follow through occurs. And we have what? We, this is July, right? We got about five, six months before the 2012 legislative session. To the extent that there is consensus built, you know, to, to the extent possible on the good ideas, and that becoming a potential legislative package, and, and certainly not all of the ideas were legislative in nature, right? Administrative, there were a lot of ideas about how changes or modifications or efforts in the administrative, administrative area can move the program forward. Um, our market research shows that everyone loves clean energy. There's no question out there. Everyone wants to see an energy independent Hawaii. 
Um, maybe we have different visions of the pathway to get there, uh, but everyone supports that vision. And then it's you know finding that energy within to actually contribute and, and make it happen. It might be sending a letter to a senator, it might be a letter to the editor, it might be just doing those things at home to make the change happen. So that's that's a big piece. In, in listening to the panels today, and particularly uh, just because it's fresh, the last panel, uh, something that continues to come up is funding uh, to make this transition happen. Private funding for the capital to make the projects happen, but really the funding to fund our agencies to do those, uh, to make the decisions, to do the analysis, to do the planning, uh, and to do the implementation. And this shows up in myriad places. I mean, if you are a, have your capital lined up, you have your permitting in place, you have your land acquired, and then your PPA is sitting before the PUC for a long time because they are choke full of these other dockets, that's a real, that's a real problem because this, uh, this capital sometimes can't wait to get the, the steel in the ground. Uh, and that comes back to why aren't we giving them the whole chunk of that um, uh, public, uh, the PUC uh, fund? Um, you know, good half of it's going to the general fund. Um, I, I think we're on a, on, a, on a fundamentally positive trajectory. I think we're, we're doing quite well uh, in terms of uh, achieving the HCEI uh, standards, but we're going to hit a roadblock at some point, uh, primarily because most of the energy, the renewables are on the neighbor islands, and most of the usage is on Oahu. And, and that's going to require a statewide holistic solution, and it's going to involve trade-offs. Uh, Oahu, certainly we use more energy than we need and we should definitely focus on efficiency and that's something that is at the forefront of our efforts at, at uh, State Energy Office uh, with our Lead by Example program. But even efficiency is not going to be enough. Um, and some people talk about distributive energy. If we put solar, solar on every rooftop, residential rooftop in this, on Oahu, that would probably achieve roughly about 6 to 10 percent of our total energy needs on Oahu. So distributive well is very important and we need it. Uh, it's not going to be enough. So we're going to have big issues that we have to face and deal with, and we need to address those as a community. And I think uh, the key is to, to develop sound processes. Um, we got off to a shaky start. Uh, we need to revisit that and make sure that we take care of each, each other in the process. Some people think that somewhere along the way from statehood till now, we kind of lost something. We lost our soul somehow. We've slipped down a slope somehow. Um, and you know, it's almost not as important as the energy itself, although that's so important. This is an opportunity for us to come together. This is the, this is the big one. This is for an opportunity for the state of Hawaii to regain something, to work together. I, I remember uh, a guy that was consulting with my firm one time, he was going on a trip, and so he said, what is your advice to us before you go on this trip? And he said, take care of each other. This is a perfect storm. We can do that. We can do it around energy, and in the process, we can have energy too. We can make a wonderful life for the state and a, an identity, a signature that we haven't had. Let's do that. It was a program that brought in the crowd, hit its mark, inspired the speakers, and stimulated lots of spirited optimism. We're glad we came, and we're glad it came together. We look forward to the next one next year, which we're going to call the Hawaii Energy Independence Day program going forward. Followed, of course, by my favorite part, lots of networking among lots of old friends and energy at the Pauhana Power Party in the courtyard of the Y, where a number of energy exhibitors show their stuff, building bridges and building an industry. Thanks to all the speakers, sponsors, exhibitors, helpers, and volunteers. And thanks to Energy Policy Forum co-chairs Mike Hamnett and Sharon Moriwaki who put the program together. Good job, great program. It was the spirit, you know, of that program, the feeling in the air with the people there. They were interested, they were vital, they wanted information, they wanted to participate, they had a lot to say, and there were so many questions we didn't have time for, so we relegated them to the courtyard <laughs> and the Powhana party to ask those questions to the panelists. I think it's a clear indication of how people are interested in energy independence. Uh, the crowd had doubled from uh, the crowd last year. And it's a great thing to be part of it. Glad you were there, Duke. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>
And now let's review our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. On July 28th, the Hawaii Venture Capital Association, ThinkTech, and Pacific New Media will present a luncheon panel program at the Plaza Club called the New Public Utilities Commission, What Will Happen Now? Featuring Chair Mina Morita, Chief Counsel Kat Awakuni, researcher Joshua Strickler, and consumer advocate Jeff Ono. On August 25th, the Hawaii Venture Capital Association, ThinkTech, and Pacific New Media will present a luncheon panel program at the Plaza Club called Newsmorphosis Redux dealing with changes in the news media after the closing of the Honolulu Advertiser and Star Bulletin a year ago. And now, here's Bill Spencer, president of the Hawaii Venture Capital Association, with this week's Spensation. As you recall, about a year ago, HVCA and ThinkTech did a really interesting half-day program we called News Morphosis 2.0. <laughs> and it was, it was really interesting. We had great keynote speakers and we really uh, we, we looked at the Constitution and the press. Uh, we were lucky to, to lucky or unlucky that the advertiser was closing down right around that time, and everything was in flux. And we had a really terrific program. It was also the uh, sort of the debut of Civil Beat. That's right. Which was a whole new um, business model for news capitalizing on the, the internet as the delivery medium. Yeah. So now it's a year, maybe a little more than a year later, and we're going to do it again. Uh, we're going to see how those sea changes have continued. And it's, it, it actually, thinking about it, it's equally interesting, if not more interesting. How has the community reacted? How is the level of information? Uh, how is investigative journalism done in this, in this market? So uh, this is on August 25th. This time we're going to make a, a two-panel program at lunch, and we're going to talk about uh, you know the, the business models in the press, uh, how the press, how these media are going to survive, and we're also going to talk about are they doing their job, are they getting the information out there, and we're going to have these panels answer those questions. Are we going to bring any bloggers in and get them out of their pajamas and put them <laughs> into Aloha Wear? And we do have a, we do have a, a blogger coming in. A, blogger and techie person who can talk about social networks. And you know, no program of this nature could be complete without social networks. We're actually going to cover the territory even in a more complete way than we did last year. You know, you know what I think is interesting and what I've noticed since last year, uh, the TV stations to a much greater extent and, and the print have started using social media. So I find that sort of interesting that they're, they're trying to engage through social media uh, and I think it'll be interesting to find out if that's if that's working for them. Uh, so this is you know this is at a time of transition somehow. Uh, we, we're dealing with citizen journalism to an extent we that's never right. had before. Uh, we're dealing with a press that cannot afford investigative journalism for the most part. Uh, are we are we really learning what we need to know? I, I think that's a that's an important point because when you think about it, uh, the local press feeds off of the national press. You look at our local newspapers and you know how much of that is is really original content. Um, it's it's all going to be discussed and hopefully we'll learn something about it on uh, August 25th, Bill. I look forward to seeing you there. Thanks, Bill. All right. Now let's check in with our co-working entrepreneurs, Richung Fujihira and Hassan Scott of theboxjelly.com and see how they're doing. As you know, the space is a pop-up space, so um, this past week we got an extension for another month, which is good. So we're going to be able to bring people in and have a little bit more stability, uh, working on maybe even getting more of an extension out there in TV land. So we, we had a website and we Everybody used... Everybody needs a website. Everybody, Everybody. needs a website. So we, nice. we did it really MVP style. We just wanted to launch and we used a site called Loose Cubes. We had a URL that direct to the Loose Cubes site. And for all those who are watching, if you do something like that and you just redirect the site to another site, um, the search engines don't pick it up. So we weren't on the search engine, so we're feverishly working on developing a new website. Uh, we're up till like 2 in the morning last night working on it. We'll be up again tonight. This evening, uh, we're going to be inviting our community out to uh, come watch an independent film screening. Uh, which is our way of welcoming our community and creating opportunity for them to come see the space. Um, developing a consistent protocol for all of our employees so when a customer comes in, um, A, B, and C should happen when a customer comes in. For example, they come in and they sign on the sign-in sheet. We always offer the customer something to drink, some tea or some coffee, um, you know, before they get settled in. 
and um, those types of, of protocols. So each of us are doing something consistent. So people know what to expect, and we know what we're doing. Each of us are doing the same thing. What about um, a, a group or a person that wants to have privacy, and he needs to sort of be in the corner away from anyone who could overhear him? Yeah, we've been working on the new plan and new proposals. That's something I didn't mention earlier. But we're planning to build our hub space, which is going to be a more of a permanent space. Although our, our original business model was having these floating spaces, we really see the need for people to have a place where they have stability. Small privacy. So yeah. we're working on that. And in that, in that space, there are going to be uh, several rooms where you can have uh, meetings where no one can hear you. Um, small rooms from you know two to four people all the way up to... Uh, 12, 20 people. And right now the way it looks is because we do have um, uh, like a month-long customer, it's kind of like a, if someone wants that space like, you know, to themselves for private space, it just has to take a special arrangement so that um, our clients are uh, made aware so that they can, you know, it doesn't interrupt their schedule when they plan to come in and use the space. You guys are both full-time doing this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Thanks to the Shidler Family Foundation, which supports a number of educational, cultural, and charitable organizations, including Think Tech. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Miko on Maui and Helco on the Big Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is the senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company, and CEO of CBI Polymers, a tech company in Hawaii. Oceanit, another local tech company, is one of Hawaii's largest and most diversified science and engineering companies. Okay, Duke, that wraps up this week's edition of Think Tech. Remember, you can watch Think Tech on OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Duke does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. You bet, Jay. For lots more Think Tech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on Think Tech on OC16, visit thinktechhawaii.com. Be a sponsor and help us reach Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. Thanks for joining us on ThinkTech. I'm Duke Oishi. Aloha, everyone.